My next guest on 21 for 21 is one of the great wheelchair racers. His six Paralympic gold medals and eight London Marathon wins put him in the pantheon of the most decorated British Paralympians of all time. He's never had things all his own way though, and a desperately disappointing Rio Games looked like the end. But he bounced back and is now looking for the marathon title at the Tokyo Paralympics. It's David Weir. So David, you're uh, down on the south coast these days, aren't you? So how's lockdown been for you there? Um, do you know what? It's not been that bad, to be honest. Um, I think because the weather changed at the right point that I was lucky enough that I could go out on government rules, you know, still go out and do my hour session a day. Um, so it's been not too bad. The only thing I did miss was I was going up to London on a Monday and a Wednesday to take my kids to school. And then I was going to, um, to the academy in the evenings. So I was, I wasn't, and then I was, sorry, in the afternoon I was doing a, a training session in the, in the park. So, um, in Richmond park. So it was just, that's the only thing that feels a bit weird, not going up to London and, and doing other things. Um, but yeah, I've, uh, I've got a good couple of routes down here and um, yeah, it's been, it's been all right to be honest. I haven't, it's not been that bad. I can just chill out after training. Usually I'm rushing around doing something or I'm driving back from somewhere, or driving there or in London or so it's, it's been quite chilled actually, different. A bit more relaxing by the sounds of it. Have you, yeah. picked, have you picked up the paintbrushes while you've, while you've been on lockdown? Is that your work behind you? No, that's not my work. That's, um, that's my partner's work. She's uh, an art teacher in a school, so um, yeah, it's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, fantastic. You should be doing your tattoos next. Uh, yeah, but I haven't, well, I've only got my back that really needs that needs doing, so um, <laughs> I might get her to draw something up for that. Listen, I've known you for some time, but I must admit, I was doing my research and I had no idea you went to the Atlanta Paralympics all the way back in 1996. So how how have the I don't say that to make you feel old. I say that to ask you sort of how the Paralympics have changed since then. I, I do feel old. Um, <laughs> actually, it's funny enough, I, I was listening um, to the, I think it was BBC Five Live commentary. Someone sent it to me of, of London 2012 and my engineers. And then within, I don't know, five minutes of listening to it, Tanny texted me with a picture which I haven't spoken to Tanny for about four or five months, um, with a picture of me in one of my first racing chairs before Atlanta. Um, so in the early 90s, um, it was just a strange situation that, you know, she, I was l listening to something on the radio and then she texted me and then I had this old picture. It just, and then the memory starts flooding back where that race was and how old was I. I think I was about nine. Um, but yeah, going back to your question, that it has changed dramatically. Um, you know, back then in '96, I just didn't feel like we was an, an athlete. You know, I, it was branded as disability sport and sport, and you know, with disabilities, it was just it was different. And you know, after the opening ceremony, I, I thought it was going to be. Um, really good because it was in America and it was, you know, it was a showpiece and the, the opening ceremony was great. And then, you know, when you go to the stadium, you can count how many people are in there. It was just like, but I was used to that anyway, but because of racing around, you know, in, in England and, and mostly in Europe, you didn't really get many people coming to watch. So I was used to it, but to, to have it at the Paralympics, you was thinking it was, you know, the, the, the opening ceremony was sold out. So you was hoping that, you know, they're going to sell tickets and, and people are going to come and watch some good racing, but it, it never happens. And it just, it made me sad, actually. It made me feel um, worthless. You know, we do the same amount of training. We do this, you know, same work and same distance. And it, it just made me feel that there was nothing in the sport for me, to be honest. I know I, I wasn't doing it, doing it for the fame, but I was just doing it for recognition, really. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I didn't think... There would ever be, you know, on level par as the Olympics. 
some of the things certainly picked up in, in Sydney, thankfully, and, and Athens. Yeah, and obviously that's right. London was something a bit different as well. I mean, your, you know, your, your CV is astonishing. You know, 10 Paralympic medals in all, um, you know, world titles, European titles, Commonwealth gold, eight London marathon wins. Does your desire to, to not just take part, but to compete in the Tokyo Paralympic marathon still stand despite the, despite the year postponement? Yeah, it's going to be tough though, because it's another year. Um, you know, in my mind, I keep changing when I want to retire. Um, it changes month by month, day by day. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be tougher because it's another year and I'm another year older. And, you know, it's not getting any easier. You know, the guys are, you know, Dan, Dan, Daniel Romanchuk's 20 years younger than me. You know, Marcel's not getting slower. He's getting quicker as well. So it, it's just, you know, and you've got the Japanese guys, that, you know, pushing really well in the marathon distance. Um, and it's a, it's a tough field. So, yeah, I'm, obviously I'm still going to go and I've given my 100% to, to take part and, and do the best I can. But, um, yeah, it will, be, it will be tough, to be honest, because each race is getting harder and harder for me at the moment just because of the amount of years I've been doing it. The guys are getting quicker. You know, I'm not getting slower, but I'm not getting any quicker. So it, it's just, you know, maintaining what I've got. Um, which is hard to take in sometimes, but um, you've just got to be realistic, really, and think about your age and what you've done over the years, the amount of miles. It's funny enough, I was talking to Simon Lawson yesterday. I sent him that picture of me in the, in the race chair, and he says, imagine how many miles you've done over your career. <laughs> it's just hard to imagine how many miles that I've done in, in a race chair. It's, it's truly... It's only when people send things back to you, oh, yeah, I must have done some miles, man. <laughs> And what is it that kind of keeps you coming back? You know, when you're talking about Tokyo and now it's a year later than you're expecting, what, you know, what is it that kind of keeps you up? I think because I'm enjoying it more than, than I have for a long time. Um, you know, I've had periods in my career where I, I just don't even want to see my chair again. Because it's so stressful sometimes and it's, um, it's so demanding and it's, you know, it's a lot of pressure um, to be at the top of your game for a long time and sometimes I just get sick of it and I just don't even want to see my chair or be involved with sport or talk to anyone about racing and, and you go through periods like that and, but at the moment I'm, I'm enjoying going out and training and doing it I'm doing the races that I want to do I have no pressure on, on on nothing else and you know I can do the marathons that I want to do and, and that's it you know I haven't got pressure from no one else to tell me what I should be doing should be on the track or should be doing this or that person and I, I just think I've got a bit of freedom um, and, and I think that's why because I can make my own decisions and I feel like I'm doing it for myself now not for everybody else I felt like I was doing everything you know the racing for my coach uh, my family uh, friends but I never felt I was doing it for myself and, and now I feel like I'm, I'm doing what I want to do and, you know, obviously Rio was well documented and the sort of, you know, the, the aftermath of that. But how, how did you manage to come back and win? Because you won the 2017 London Marathon, 2018 London Marathon. You know, how did you manage to bounce back from, from Rio? Um, I don't really know, to be honest. Um, that, that from September to April was probably the toughest that I've ever experienced in life and in training. Um, I only had a couple of weeks off after the war. Um, I had loads of things going on in my head and other you know, personal problems and um, I didn't know what to do. And, and I just think, you know, I kept ticking over because I wanted to prove that I could still race. Um, some days I don't know how I trained, to be honest. Um, I don't know how I got out of bed. I don't know how, you know, it was a struggle every day, to be honest, to, to get motivated to do something. But to be honest, I just did that race in 2017 to prove a point to everyone else, not myself. And this is why I keep going back to, like, I was proving a point to everyone. And it didn't mean anything to me. I broke the record and, you know, I've winning the most London marathons. But, like, I remember, like, shouting after the, line and then after that it just fizzled out and I didn't really care I didn't 
had no feelings. I didn't have anything. And then and that was, I was ready to retire then, to be honest. That was, uh, I was at breaking point then. I, I, and I didn't touch my racing chair. I did that race and I didn't get back into my racing chair until January of 2018. Because I just wasn't ready for everything. You know, I was struggling personally and I was struggling with racing. I thought that was making me depressed and, and sad. And um, actually, it was the opposite. I think that was the thing that I needed to do to make me better. So, um, but I had that time off and then I come back and then I win the Minerva in 2018, which was luck, a lot of luck. Um, but in 2017, I remember going through the race. And you know what? You know, people always ask me, what do you think about when you're in, in the race situation? Especially in 2012, I don't remember any of the races, really, because it was just a blur. You know, I just remember crossing the line, that's it, and the aftermath. I, I don't really remember much of the racing. But in London in 2017, I remembered every single bit of the race. Right. And I remember just going through the race and I, can't, I think it was about 11 miles in and we was in a big pack and I just knew I was going to win. I knew I was going to win. Um, and then I, was, I knew what I was going to tell the press when I crossed that line. I knew that, that I had to tell them that I was struggling with depression. And, you know, everything in Rio, but, you know, years before that and childhood and stuff like that. So... Um, I knew that was the right point to do it, but I knew I needed to win to say it because if I didn't win and did say it, people would think that I was just making excuses. So I had to win so I could get get my point across. Of, of and I'm glad I done it. I did it in the um, the press conference in the room, loads of photographers, and I just come out with it. And you could see all their faces drop because they didn't even know, didn't realise it. Um, and it was probably the best thing that I've ever done, to be honest, to speak out and, and talk about things. And yeah, and uh, yeah, I can remember that race very clearly to, out of any of the, the races that I've done in my career. It's wonderful that things are much more positive for you now and you feel in control and want to keep going. Is, is, um, is track completely done and dusted for you? Is it marathons all the <laughs> way now? Yeah, I, try, I don't have the, no desire to go on the track. I don't even train on the track anymore. I only do it if uh, my coach, Jen, asks me to do some stuff for some of the guys on the track. Uh, so we've got a good, good guys that Dylan, um, who's probably could make Tokyo if he has a good year, but it just depends because there's no, no races. So, um, yeah, so if he needs help, I'll obviously, you know, I'm, I'm there to, to help him and obviously I help him on the rollers and on the road as well but track racing is totally different to, to road racing it's uh, very demanding very tactical very fast very fierce so it's a totally different ball game to, to road racing so yeah that's the only time that I go back on the track hmm. I'll do, do you know what I, I, I would go and do some little races maybe in Stoke Mandeville or something like that just to maybe help some of my squad members in that but I wouldn't take it seriously. And I know you're really passionate about the academy, the coaching side of things now. Is that where you sort of see yourself going in, in the future, maybe after Tokyo? Yeah, well, we, we do a lot now. and um, We've got a good setup now in Kingston. Uh, we've got you know, a brand new uh, indoor centre that we, we've got funded and we built. And it's just like an indoor roller session uh, centre. Um, and it's, we've got our own space there as well. So it's, it's pretty nice and it's like a social gathering as well. So, yeah, I think um, that will be the plan. Um, it's, it's hard being an athlete and coaching because you, you, you always think that they, they can be like you. You know, so I'm always learning off Jenny how, how she's very good at adapting programs for individuals and, and you know, getting them getting the best out of them uh, and, and changing things. And, you know, sometimes being hard, sometimes being soft, you know, just knowing the right moments uh, of, of how to be with, with certain people. So I'm learning a lot still from, from Jen. We've got a good lot coaching there as well. Jen's uh, grandson uh, has done a few of his uh, badges now, but he's learning loads from, 
and Jenny, uh, and from me as well. He always asks me questions, you know, about tactics and push techniques and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, we've got a good squad down there and we've got a lot of people learning. Um, got a lot of young athletes uh, improving. Uh, and that's, you know, that, that probably will be the, you know, a bit of my, my career. I don't think I could take a full coaching role. Um, I don't think it's in my makeup yet, but I can be advised and be there and, you know, give them talks and, you know, give them encouragement and, you know, change certain things in, in training. But day to day training programs, I think Jenny's just the master of it. You see that in football a lot, don't you? Where the, the, you know, some great players go on to be great managers, some great players go on to be sort of, you know, not great managers because it feels like the, the players they're coaching are either massively inspired or massively intimidated by the person yeah. doing the coaching. I, I, I see, in a similar situation, aren't you? Yeah, Jenny's, Jenny's more like a Harry Redner. <laughs> you know, she's, yeah. you know, we'll put you her arm around people. You mean that as a compliment, don't you, David? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> as, a, as a coach, yeah. She's, she's like that, put her, her arm around them, but she will kick them up the ass as well if they need it or, you know, she she's good at that, and she's, you know, she's good at talking and and if you're down and stuff like that. So she's yeah, she she reminds me of, you know, like a, a Harry Redknapp. So what about you? Coaching. Who are you? I don't know to be honest. I can I I for me I can lose the rag quite easy. So, um, I wouldn't do it with it, like with the kids and stuff. But yeah, I get quite frustrated quite easily. So, and then I have to take a step back and think. Well, actually. I'm thinking about myself. I'm not thinking what, you know, they might not be as good as you yet. That's what you get put thinking of. You know, they're looking up to you, so you've got to give them encouragement and talk to them and show them new ways of how to do it. And so, yeah, that, that's what I'm learning. Well, we're obviously really looking forward to seeing you in action in Tokyo, but actually it's exciting to think about the future and seeing one of your protégés come through in the Paralympics of, you know, Paris or... LA or even sort of after that, that, that actually mm. must give you a lot of uh, excitement as well at that, that thought. Yeah, it does. Um, but the thing is, I, you know, I set up the academy just for people to get involved in wheelchair sports. So we've got a lot of kids that, you know, might not, never make it, but they just love training, keeping fit and, you know, being motivated and being part of something. Um, because, you know, being in schools, they don't really get to do much sport. So when they come in, come to the academy on a Monday and uh, Wednesday, they feel alive. Yeah. You know, you can see it in their eyes. They're buzzing to be there. And, you know, they, they want to enjoy it. They enjoy it and stuff like that. So, yeah, so it's not just about making the next gold medal. Obviously, we want to do that. You know, there's some guys that I didn't think would ever make it. Like Olivia, she's, you know, got cerebral palsy. She can hardly see and she's deaf as well. So, when she first came to the track, I thought, this is, I, I don't know how they're going to get her. She couldn't even push in a straight line. She couldn't, but now she's like, you know, if the T33s have a big enough squad, she'll definitely make, make Tokyo because she's just proved everyone wrong. She proved me wrong. You know, she's so determined. It, it's just nice to see that, you know, you don't think they're going to do something and then they just, just improve every year. So it's amazing to see. That's what I like, seeing improvement. Yeah, that's fantastic. You must feel really proud. Well, mm. um, listen, take care and keep on enjoying the the South Coast. And um, I think I think you should have a go at this art. You should get your partner to uh, give you a few little lessons, and uh, we'll have you oh. doing like caricatures in Tokyo or something. Yeah, uh, my art's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, David. Great. Cheers, to mate. You. And you, bye. Mate. bye.